must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support, and now for the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Stephanie Wyrock, and today we are delighted to have Dr. James Gordon on our show. He delivered the 45th Macmillan Lecture at the 2014 NEXT Conference in Charlotte, North Carolina, which happened to be my first Macmillan Lecture that I attended as a second year physical therapy student, and it has really left a lasting impression on me. So I'm very excited to uh, have interview Dr. Gordon today. He is the Associate Dean and Chair of the Division of Biokinesiology and Physical Therapy at the University of Southern California, and he is the Fellow of the American Physical Therapy Association. So thank you, Dr. Gordon, for joining us today. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie, and also uh, to Brandon, who I know couldn't be here, And uh, but uh, thank you both of you for inviting me. Uh, let me begin by saying that uh, this uh, series of podcasts that you are doing is a truly remarkable achievement, and uh, you know, it's very, very impressive, and uh, you guys ha- have really emerged as leaders in the field. This is a uh, uh, a series of, of discussions that I think has impact in healthcare education and, and in physical therapy in general. And uh, I'm honored to be invited to be on this podcast. Well, thank you, Dr. Gordon. Thank you so much. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, so I, I, think, uh, I think telling you how I got where I am today would require the whole po- podcast, and maybe we shouldn't do that. But let me just make a couple of points. Uh, First of all, I am very, very lucky to be a physical therapist. And and, uh, I say that sincerely. I uh, I don't think I found physical therapy. Physical therapy found me. I washed up on the shores of physical therapy as a refugee from the craziness of the 1960s. uh, And becoming a physical therapist gave purpose and direction to my life. Uh, and, uh, you know, it really has, has uh, uh, changed the direction of my life in, in obviously in major ways. Uh, I began life as a PT in the trenches. I was a physical therapist in acute care and, and rehab and home care. Uh, and, uh, you know, pretty soon after I started, I, I began to realize that my ability to help my patients get better was uh, not quite what I wanted it to be. Um, at first, I thought that was my fault, as I think most young physical therapists do. Uh, I thought I just needed more experience. But eventually, I realized that uh, that there was a significant lack of basic research and evidence underlying the therapies that we were using at the time. Mostly this was in neuro for me. And that realization led me back to school. Um, I had vowed never to go back, but I did end up going back to graduate school this time. Um, And uh, later it led me to become a researcher and later a teacher and eventually to become an academic leader. Um, and why? Because, to, because my goal has always been to make physical therapy better, to make it, to make it more effective. Uh, and to make physical therapy better, we need to make physical therapy education better, to educate physical therapists who are better prepared to help our patients. In my view, 
this is the number one issue facing the physical therapy profession today. We need to make physical therapy better, more effective. Um, I know there's a lot of discussion out there about other big issues, but I think this is the big issue. And I think you know that very well. You work every day treating patients. Uh, and I, uh, you know, we, we all know this. We, we realize that we don't have all the answers. Um, we, to find those answers, we need to continue to grow our really quite young research enterprise. And we also need to continue to improve physical therapy education. So this objective to improve physical therapy, to make it better, has motivated my entire professional career, and it continues to motivate me. I think that that's a very common theme, Dr. Gordon, that we hear on this podcast. A lot of the leaders that we interview say that what has inspired them to do what they do has been to make the profession better. And, you know, that's why Brandon Scott and I do this podcast is because we want to help make the profession better by improving the education that we give our future healthcare leaders. So one of the ways that, you, that people have made the profession better has been through the Macmillan Lectureship. It's the highest achievement that one can, can get within the American Physical Therapy Association as far as lectures go. Uh, tell us a little bit about what it is and how you reacted when you found out that you were going to deliver this lecture at the, first, at the 2014 NEXT conference. Okay, so the Macmillan Lecture is uh, named for Mary Macmillan, the, the, one of the founders of our profession, and it's a le lecture given every year at APTA's annual conference in June, which is now called NEXT. It was established in 1964, and in fact, this coming June, Tom McPoyle will be delivering the 50th Macmillan Lecture um, uh, at the NEXT conference. Uh, in Chicago. Um, so each year, a leader of the profession is chosen to deliver the lecture. So of course, I was honored. But I have to confess that I was not surprised to, uh, because uh, the process of selection requires a very detailed and uh, uh, packet, nomination packet. And I was very well aware that this was, was being done. And so and I had, I had agreed to this and in fact, uh, you know, wanted to do it. So this is really uh, a the, the uh, be careful what you wish for kind of news that you get. So when you find out, you know, now you say, oh, <laughs> first of all, the first thing you realize is that you now have a major homework assignment, which is to read all the previous Macmillan lectures. And in my case, that was 44 lectures. Um, and, uh, you know, and I did that. Uh, these lectures form a history of our profession. Um, really, the ideas that have driven our profession forward over the last half century. So it's it's really a fascinating way to look at the profession. Um, but when you read them, you really understand the assignment that you've been given. You have this responsibility to say something that will have significance and impact for the profession. So it's a, it's a daunting challenge. And the topic that you ended up choosing was program consolidation, which I remember sitting in the audience listening to that. And, you know, I remember when you had brought that up, there were a few people who were like, yay, and a few people who were, you know, there were some gasps from the audience. So I'm interested in how you chose that as your topic for Macmillan and kind of what you were expecting to what you were expecting to hear from the audience when you delivered it. Yeah, well certainly my my objective was to challenge the audience and challenge the profession um, which I think that that is one of the responsibilities you have. Um, I wouldn't necessarily refer to my topic as program consolidation uh, the title of my lecture was If Greatness is a Goal. And um, I think the overall theme was the importance of, of striving for excellence in academic physical therapy and really the notion that academic physical therapy, physical therapy schools are the engine that drives our profession forward. But it is true that I did mention that consolidation of programs would be better than the current trend 
which was and and I think continues to be the creation of many small under-resourced PT programs. So I did present that as a uh, an important trend that we needed to uh, to to turn around, and I put forward consolidation as one approach to that. And I know that I know that you had mentioned in the lecture as well that one of the ways that we can achieve excellence in physical therapy is to make sure that we are having a three-tier mission within DPT programs. So that three-tier mission was research, education, and clinical practice. Why do you think that it's important for DPT programs to have strength in all three of these areas? Because this is the mission of academic physical therapy. Academic physical therapy is not just teaching. The role of the academic enterprise is to, of course, educate the next generation of physical therapists and also physical therapy scientists, but also discovering the cause and treatments for disabling health conditions and translating those into the practice of patient care. Um, so this is our mission. It is not just to teach. It is also to advance the practice of physical therapy. This will not happen anywhere else. It has to happen within the, the, the uh, academic uh, physical therapy enterprise. I know that a lot of uh, my colleagues who you know are new professionals, when they had to do research within their programs, a lot of the studies that they did were you know, measuring isokinetic force of the quadriceps muscle or you know, some, some relatively simple research studies to get students to be introduced to the research process. When you're talking about research, how, how do you define that research mission specifically? Is it something that we should be making sure that programs are getting large research grants to really address important questions in physical therapy? Or is it so that physical therapists can really understand um, how research is performed, how to analyze research, or is it kind of a combination of both? Well, you know, first of all, I don't, I don't uh, believe that uh, physical therapy students should necessarily be required to carry out research studies. Um, that is not what I mean by having research in DPT programs. Uh, we don't do that at USC. We, uh, we do our best to educate our students to be intelligent, critical consumers of research and, and um, ability to, tr to use evidence in their selection of treatments and, and uh, how, they, how they make clinical decisions. We do also provide opportunities for research for those students who are interested, but let's face it, that is a, a minority of students. So when I say research, I'm not talking about necessarily laboratory research publishing in medical journals. I mean, certainly that's important, but I, I think I'm talking about scholarship that will advance the practice of physical therapy and ultimately help our patients. And this can be educational research, uh, health policy studies, translation of research into practical treatments, writing textbook chapters that will advance the field. It can mean a lot of things. It can even mean organizing a series of podcasts on important educational issues. Um, so, uh, I think there's a lot of ways to do scholarship. But let me say this, in order to be good teachers, see, I think there's this misconception that you can be a good teacher and that's enough. And I don't think that is works. In order to be good teachers, faculty need to be engaged in advancing the scholarship of physical therapy. Physical therapy is not just a collection of knowledge and skills that we can hand to somebody who's a good teacher and then that person will, will teach the students. Physical therapy is a living, breathing discipline that is dynamic, continually changing. Um, remember, these are graduate programs we're talking about, doctoral programs, we're talking about doctoral programs. We are educating doctors of physical therapy. I would argue that to be a good teacher, you must be engaged with the scholarship of physical therapy. I think that's a great point. And I think that, you know, that's something that you made very clear in your Macmillan lecture and something that really resonated with me when I listened. 
uh, one of the things that I, I know when I've talked to other people about this lecture, because it has made such an impact on me, and I have brought it up to many of my colleagues and asked their opinions on it, that um, people who are stakeholders in smaller programs have a uh, have a little bit of a disagreement on this topic. How would you respond to this group um, as stakeholders in smaller programs? Look, I, I have taught in small programs. In fact, in the 1990s, I started a PT program which had a relatively small faculty. So I can empathize with my colleagues in these programs. And as I stated in my, my Macmillan, I have enormous respect for my colleagues across the landscape of physical therapy education. I know many, many hundreds of faculty members. Um, most of these people are amazingly talented. They're dedicated individuals. And they're, like me, motivated to improve physical therapy by educating better and better at DPTs. Unfortunately, I think many of these faculty are in small programs that are structurally inadequate. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the reality. Now, I'm not arguing that we should immediately close those programs and force those faculty to join other large programs. <laughs> that isn't going to happen anyway. Uh, what I am saying is that we should at least stop the bleeding by not starting new programs that are too small. And we should begin to uh, a process to establish standards on the minimum size of a program. And when I talk about size, I'm talking about the number of faculty. And then we can develop a plan and a timetable for bringing programs into compliance with that plan. This is a process that would take many years, but the longer we wait, the harder it will be. Yeah, I know that there's uh, new programs that are opening you know, every year. So I think that you make a really good point on that. And CAPTI is the one that sets the minimal standards for programs. Um, you said that this would take many, many years. What types of changes do you think CAPTI would need to implement in order to make this successful so that we can make sure that our DPT programs are reaching these three tiers that are needed for um, scholarship, education, and clinical teaching? So I'm not sure it's accurate to say that CAPTI sets a minimum standard. Generally speaking, actually, CAPTI allows programs to determine for themselves what is the minimum. With respect to faculty, for example, CAPTI does not set any standard for the minimum number of core faculty. They simply state that the program must demonstrate that the co collective core faculty is sufficient in number. Truly. I mean, this is the way it's worded that, that, that the program. Uh, determines what is the sufficient number of faculty. I know this very well because we just went through our accredit reaccreditation process last year. I don't think it really is up to CAPTI. I think the profession needs to determine what size a program should be. And when I'm talking about size, again, I mean how many faculty. How many faculty does a PT program need? Do, do, does, is five or six faculty members enough? Seven or eight? More than half of all programs have fewer than 10 core faculty. I'm not sure that even 10 is enough. And uh, when, you, when you say core faculty, Dr. Gordon, can you define what that means? Well, CAPTI has a specific definition, but we're really talking about full-time faculty in the program who are dedicated to the, to the DPT education. So who are involved in the DPT education. So um, we could say, full-time faculty who are involved in DPT education. So, you know, the, the fact is that at one time, a small number of faculty may have been adequate, but the profession has changed a lot. This is not your grandmother's physical therapy profession anymore. That we have a very complex profession. It's impossible for a single faculty member to have the depth of knowledge and skill to teach all of orthopedic physical therapy, for example. A program needs faculty with expertise in shoulder, lumbar spine, cervical spine, hip and pelvis, knee, foot and ankle, hand. That's just in orthopedics. The same is true in neuro, peds, cardiopulmonary. There are, um, you know, specialty areas. We, I think we now have nine accredited specialty areas with residencies. Um, there are emerging specialty areas, 
pelvic floor, vestibular, wound management. Um, there, there is a, a breadth of expertise that's needed to, to treat, to teach our students today. And there's no way that five or six or eight, I think, or even 10 faculty members can do all of this, plus deal with all of the basic sciences and the rest of it. So I think we need as a, as a, a profession to determine what is the, the minimum standard for the number of faculty. I think that's a good place to start. How, uh, how would we go about agreeing on that as a profession? Is that something that we would maybe like experts within the field would meet about this? Would this be something that um, would talk about at House of Delegates? How, how would you propose that we start to maybe talk about this and agree on this number? Yeah, so um, in my Macmillan address, I propose that we should, um, we should uh, have the equivalent of a new Flexner type report. Um, the Flexner report was a report that came out about 100 years ago and transformed medical education. And, uh, and this was, was uh, 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 a, a report that had been uh, funded and run by the Carnegie uh, Foundation. So it was really outside the medical school. So what I think is that we need to have a process wh where a, an objective outside group of people take a look at our, at our profession and at our educational system and make specific, well, first of all, compare it to the healthcare disciplines <clears throat> that we want to compare ourselves to, like medicine and dentistry, the other doctoring professions, pharmacy, and say, and, and really uh, and, uh, establish some basis for comparison and a way to, um, to establish standards for things like size and uh, and that sort of thing. So that would be my approach. So the proposal then, um, obviously it would be somebody outside of PT that would be coming in and serving as some type of, as a consultant, similar to what the Carnegie Foundation did for the Flexner, for the Flexner Report in 1910. And for those of you listening who aren't familiar with the Flexner Report, it was actually done by somebody who was a, uh, a teacher in a high school. It wasn't even done by somebody who was uh, in, uh, doing college of uh, college professorship, so it was somebody even outside of the medical school realm that was able to publish this report. Are there any? Is there any literature that examines the differences between physical th physical therapist readiness or skill or development between PT schools who come from institutions that have more core faculty uh, versus maybe institutions who have fewer core faculty? <laughs> Yeah, so if there is a literature, I'm, I'm not aware of it. Um, we certainly need such studies. And I, uh, you know, we need a lot of studies of this sort. The problem is that we have no metric on which to base such a comparison. Um, every school has its own distinct way of measuring its own outcomes. So there's really no way to compare its uh, apples and oranges and kumquats. And, uh, this is, by the way, another area where CAPTI could be helpful. CAPTI does not require, CAPTI uh, allows every program in, to, to develop its own way to, to uh, measure its outcomes. If CAPTI would provide a standard set of outcomes to measure, then we could begin to compare programs. But we have no basis for doing that at the moment. Um, so I do think this is a, a real need. We need to be able to measure outcomes in physical therapy education. And I think that's another direction that we should be going. There's a lot of, this is where, coming back to scholarship, there's a lot of need for more research and scholarship in the area of physical therapy education. Going, uh, I kind of want to go back just a little bit. You know, we talked a lot about the Flexner Report and we talked about you know, medical education and how that changed medical education. How does DPT education compare to medical, medical education? I know that uh, um, medical education is a lot more standardized than what PT education is, or at least that's what people on this podcast have told us. 
Um, what types of comparisons and um, differences can you make between the two types of education? Yeah, well, to say to say they are more standardized than physical therapy education is not uh, is is not to say much because it's a very low bar. PT education is completely non-standardized. There is no there's no standard curriculum. There's no standard anything, um, and this is a real problem. Um, I did discuss this considerably in my Macmillan and also in a in the previous lecture I gave the Sarasoli lecture where I also address this topic. And um, the, the, main th the main thing I, I pointed out was that the average class size in PT programs is much smaller than in these other uh, disciplines. And it's about a third of what you see in medical schools. It's actually less than a third of what you see in medical schools. Um, the same for pharmacy schools, and it's about half the size, their class size is about half the size of dental schools. Um, these are the doctoring professions that we want to be compared with. Um, the real issue is the number of faculty. Small class sizes translate to small faculty sizes. Um, let's, let's take a look at medical education for a minute. And I, I would ask this question, why are physicians the dominant healthcare profession today? And I would argue, that this is largely because of their system of medical schools, academic medicine. Uh, generally speaking, people, both patients and other healthcare professions, believe that medical schools do a good job of training physicians, and they believe that medical schools advance the practice of medicine through basic and clinical research. This is the foundation of medicine's dominance in the healthcare marketplace. And uh, I don't say that we should necessarily copy medical schools, but we do need to achieve this same level of respect and credibility in the healthcare community. People need to have confidence that PT schools do a good job of training PTs, and not just some PT schools, but all PT schools, because that's what we see in medicine. There's a pretty consistent standard in medical schools, and we have to we have to have the same kind of consistency in PT schools, that PT schools do a good job of training physical therapists and that they are advancing the practice of physical therapy through research and scholarship. Yeah, I think that that is a really great point. And I think that in order to achieve the prestige of medicine that we, uh, the prestige that medicine has in physical therapy, like you said, we don't necessarily have to copy it, but we definitely have to be striving to make sure that we are creating good good knowledge so that our students can advance and become the best physical therapists that they can be. Let's talk a little bit about another kind of elephant in the room with, um, deep, with DPT education, and that's student debt. It's a huge problem in healthcare education, not just even in, deep, in physical therapy school. How do you think, uh, how do you think having program program consolidation will affect DPT uh, student, the DPT student debt crisis, because we know that this is a huge issue. It's actually the number one problem cited by our guests on our podcast that people would like to change about healthcare education. So do you have a solution for that? <laughs> you know, if I had a solution for that, you know, I would be, uh, you know, up for the Nobel Prize, right? Yeah, I wish I could say that program consolidation would solve this DPT student debt crisis. Um, I think it could help. Uh, I could say that larger programs can achieve economies of scale. Um, but, you know, I mean, I don't think that's really going to solve the problem. And in fact, I, I actually think there are several misconceptions about DPT student debt. And the first misconception is that this is a problem we can solve in physical therapy. It's not. Student debt is a societal problem. We won't solve it in physical therapy. Society as a whole has to solve this problem. Another misconception I think about student debt is that it's inherently a bad thing. Um, but in fact, student loans are, have been the pathway to access to higher education for many, many millions of students. Most students would not have access to higher education without student loans. So they, they, they certainly can't depend on state 
governments to fund education. State funding of education and is, is going down every year. And uh, so student loans are the way in which, uh, you know, college is going to, and, and graduate school is going to be uh, financed, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future. So, and for most students, it's a good investment. I mean, you know, just like buying a house is a good investment. I think, you know, taking out loans for your education is a good investment. Um, now, I'm not saying that the level of student debt isn't a major, major problem, especially for our DPT students. It is. And we have to find ways to solve this problem. I think those are going to happen at the national level. There are a couple of of legislative initiatives out there now that I think can begin to, to address these, but I'm not an expert in that. Let, let me say this, however. In my Macmillan, I argue that the way to solve this problem is not, let me repeat, not to make DPT education cheaper. The only way to make DPT education cheaper in the current environment is to shorten it. We do see some people arguing that this is the way to go. Uh, hey, I could cut tuition by a third by taking a year off uh, off uh, my program, shorten the programs from three years to two, and now we've uh, cut the tuition by a third. I would argue that this inevitably means reducing the quality of the graduate. Anyone who tells you that they can achieve the same quality of, of education after cutting a year off the program is selling you a bill of goods. I think this is just common sense. I mean, you were not so long ago in physical therapy school. I'm sure you, as, as all of our, my students, worked your butt off for the, all of that time. I can't imagine you could say, yeah, okay, if I had been, I could have just cut uh, a year off that program and I would be in the same place I am now. Not, not going to happen. When I discuss this with my faculty, they say, oh, okay, which year should I cut? You know, 20 to 25 years ago, we began the transition from the masters to the DPT. We decided as a profession to elevate the profession's educational degree. In the year 2000, APTA adopted a radical new Vision 2020. And that Vision 2020 statement said by 2020, physical therapy will be provided by physical therapists who are doctors of physical therapy, recognized by consumers and other healthcare professionals as the practitioners of choice. When we made this shift, we made a promise. We made a promise to the educational institutions that we were in, to the other healthcare professions, and to our patients. We said, we are going to elevate our profession to a doctoring profession. When we cut a year off our program or we cheapen our programs in other ways, we are breaking that promise. We are saying, we didn't really mean doctors exactly. We're not real doctors. We're not real doctors. We're we're just kind of partial doctors, maybe doc, like chiropractors or something of that sort. Um, and I think that I think if we go that route, we 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 head off into oblivion as a profession. I know that uh, one of the models that has been proposed that kind of goes along the line of what you're talking about, Dr. Gordon, with shortening DPT programs are the hybrid models. So this has been proposed to be, to help decrease some of the cost of DPT education. What do you think the role of the hybrid DPT model in program consolid in the program consolidation debate is? Um, and then you can, even if you wanna add on something about student debt for that as well, um, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, so as you know, we at USC have, have begun a hybrid pathway in our DPT program. And, and uh, uh, we feel that this has a lot of promise. I, I, I don't think by itself the hybrid models solve the, the cost problem or the, I think they do solve the access problem. I think the primary benefit of hybrid models is that they provide access to non-traditional students who would have otherwise 
a hard time going to, to programs in, in what we call a residential mode. And they do also provide a mechanism for expanding the size of programs, expanding the size of faculty, and extending the research of programs. And I think that this is, this is going to be important because I think our healthcare system is changing in radical ways. We're seeing a lot of consolidation. We talk about consolidation, but uh, consolidation is happening in the healthcare system. And I think we need to have programs that can, that can have a national reach because healthcare systems increasingly are having large regional and national reach. And so um, I do think hybrid models are, are going to be a big part of the future in physical therapy education. Do you think that the hybrid models will be able to absorb some of these smaller programs? Or do you think that especially, let's say, you know, a PT flexor report comes out. Do you think that those programs will just would just not be non-existent anymore? Or do you think that they could be absorbed? Kind of like how a health system absorbs like a community hospital. Yeah, I would I would uh, I wouldn't want to use the word absorb. <laughs> it sounds I don't know that programs would like that. I think there's a tremendous opportunity for partnerships and hybrid models provide a a, a way to to do that. I, I also think that hybrid models provide a potential solution to, um, to the problems we face in delivering healthcare to um, rural areas and underserved areas in the country. And so I think that these are, are, would definitely be a way to, um, to address those kind of problems as well. So I, I like any way to think more of partnerships than, than just absorbing. Yeah, that's probably a more eloquent word. Thank you for uh, adding that to the conversation. Uh, So at the end of all of our podcasts, we uh, finish with a question. And um, that question is, if you could change one aspect of healthcare education, DPT or otherwise, what would you change and how would you change it? Now, I know this whole conversation has been talking about how we're going to change DPT education. So we've talked a lot about, you know, program consolidation. We've talked about the DPT hybrid. We've talked about a Flexner report. I mean, these are all very, like, very novel things within our profession. So you can take this question and repeat things that you've said before, or if you want to mention something that maybe we haven't talked about yet, I'd be interested to know kind of how you would answer this question. Yeah, let me take that in a slightly different direction. I'd like to see healthcare education come down from its ivory tower into the real world. And I think the way to uh, to do this is for each DPT program to have its own clinical practice. Um, th- this is a, a real clinical practice that has to be financially successful or at least uh, viable to break even. Um, I think that too often as physical therapy faculty, we take a somewhat superior attitude. We say sort of, this is the way it should be done, but out in the clinic, you may not find it being done this way. And I, I, I think it's very easy to do that when we are up in our ivory towers. We need to learn to 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 practice what we preach. We need to have clinical practices that are part of our programs. I think it's like having skin in the game. We need to be able to demonstrate that what we teach can be successful in the real world. And students have to see that. Students need to see that what we're teaching, that we can provide quality physical, high quality of physical therapy and still be financially successful. Um, You know, everybody, when I talk about a three-tier mission for DPT programs, everybody gets all into the issue of research, but nobody really questions the clinical practice part. Um, But in fact, relatively few PT programs have their own clinical practice. When I did some research on this some years ago, I found out that less than 25% of PT programs have any form of program-sponsored practice. Um, How can we teach a clinical discipline when we don't have our own practices? Um, 
it's hard to have a clinical practice that makes money. Now, that is not a statement that will shock most private practice owners out there. Um, but in PT education, we have very little appreciation for that. Um, and in my view, we have no credibility unless and until we have skin in the game and we have our own clinical practices. I think that's a great point. I know I went to Washington University in St. Louis, and so we had a clinical practice. So as students, Definitely. So yep. as students we were able to go in you know, and observe or... Um, we were able to be a student within that clinical practice, so we were exposed to it a lot. We even got to be treated by our professors if we had a problem, which was always a really kind of a cool little twist of being a PT student, having kind of what you're learning in class apply to your body. So I think that that's a good point, and I was not even aware that only 25% of practice of, of uh, programs have a practice. I mean, you know, I only know what I know, so... I just assumed that most, it made sense to me that you would have a practice. But as a private practitioner too, I can appreciate the statement of, you know, it's hard to run a practice that's a viable practice because you're always kind of scraping the, scraping for, for viability. So that's a good point. You know, Dr. Gordon, this has been a wonderful conversation. I know that I've, you know, I'm even still learning a lot about this topic talking to you. And I feel like I learned so much even listening and rereading your Macmillan lecture while preparing for this interview. And I know that our, our listeners are also going to have questions for you or want to reach out to you with questions and comments. So if, um, if people want to reach out to you, where can they find you on social media or online? Well, okay. I, I wish I could say i have an active Twitter account and all of that, but I, I don't. I, I mean, I do have a little bit of a Twitter presence, but I don't have time really or the uh, inclination to spend a lot of time. But I do welcome, in, you know, comments and questions from students, other faculty, whoever, and my email is, and which I, uh, you know, you, you can certainly uh, publish on on your website, but it's James Gore at usc.edu, um, and uh, I welcome you know any comments on this podcast. I'd love to hear them and or questions or ideas that you know go beyond it. Anything of that sort. I think this is an important discussion. And we will put uh, Dr. Gordon's uh, contact information in the show notes, so make sure you are looking out for that. Well, thank you again, Dr. Gordon, for joining us today. And thank you for, to all of you for listening to us today. And we'll see you next time on the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients, as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. Anywhere Healthcare, a telehealth platform, is a simple, low-cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare, which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.